Hi, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'll just introduce briefly this uh, conference. So this is the Middle East Chinese Student Association. We have an annual conference and peer review journal that we publish every year. And the whole purpose of this conference to host this every year is to promote an academic form of discourse on this campus. Because of the type of education we have, the courses we take, we're well prepared to engage with very, very specific topics concerning different regions. And we feel that promoting discourse about the Middle East itself is a very important part of actually being here. You cannot spend four years here without engaging with the different issues, problems, uh, developments that occur in the Middle East. And we feel that providing this platform, not only to Middle Eastern students, but to people from abroad as well, as we've, we have two people from the US this year, others are presenting uh, via Zoom, we've had people from different universities around the world in the past as well. And we feel this is a very important platform through which the student body can engage not only with faculty, but with their colleagues abroad. And we feel that promoting discourse between different regions, different countries around the world concerning the Middle Eastern region is a very important way for us to go forward into the world, bring different types of discourse into our future studies as well. With that, I'll just introduce the, the theme. The theme for this year is the emerging Middle East, social fragmentation and integration. And it's a very pertinent topic to today's developments. We have a variety of issues facing the Middle East in different parts, in different ways, economic, political, cultural, social. And we feel that these topics all are shaping up towards uh, an evolution of this region. And what that leads to is very unclear for everyone uh, inside this room and outside as well. So we have, the panels we have deal with very, very different topics. They deal with security, political economy, extremism, cultures, society, reformation, reconciliation, and plethora of topics. And that, for us, is the most important part of this conference, not just focusing on one aspect, not just on the political or the economic or the security, but bringing people from different discourses to talk about the same issue a more viable solution. With that, I will just like to thank all of you for coming, and I hope all of you get to stay, listen to some of the panels we have, listen to the panelists, and what different types of uh, opinions they bring to this conference. I will just introduce Toby to welcome our keynote speaker. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So, not only is the point of this conference to have discourse, but also to come up with different sorts of solutions. And when looking uh, towards viable solutions and what works and what doesn't, one must always look towards the future. And following this trope, it is my greatest honor and pleasure to introduce the former minister of the food security program in Qatar, and definitely one of the leading visionaries of this country, Mr. Fahad al -Atiyah. Modernity, there's a lot of misconceptions about these two terms because they have a lot of impact on our life okay, on, and on the discourse. Um, how do you understand these two side by side facing each other and whatever? Are we individuals or members of a society? I think our beloved sociologist can help us understand this. But of course, these are one of the bigger questions that I came across. Um, there's a big impact on, on how, to, how do you define yourself. Uh, and do we have rights or also obligations? That's a pretty obvious one, but we seem to be obsessed with our rights, very much less interested in our obligations. What makes a country viable? Um, I think that's one of the fundamental questions that I have to ask myself at the start of the journey uh, of running the food security program. We have 194 countries in the world. What makes a country a viable country or state? What is the criteria for sound investment? 
By the way, all these questions relate to each other. They might, they might seem random, but, um, but somehow they are connected. And I'd like to think about them because I think the reason I wanted to start with questions is because I wanted your answers to these questions and perhaps we can start a discussion around them. So if you note them down, if, if you so wish. What is the danger of assumptions? Someone said to me they were a consultant for a little while. And um, when we go and advise people, we always come with our assumptions, don't we? And, uh, but, I mean, are there, can some assumptions help or can they be counterproductive? Can you handle truth? I mean, truth, and, and let's say, someone will say, oh, so what is truth? What constitutes the truth to you? Is death truth? Yes, it is true. There is certainty about certain truths. Other truths are relative. Um, but let's say, if I tell you the temperature outside is 50 degrees, is that true or not? Do you have water in this country? Is that true or not? Do you have food? Is that true or not? Do you have people? Is that true or not? Some people wish to deny that, you know. Can you control your ego? Yeah. When you work in government, you, f you face a lot of that, perhaps also in academia, I don't know. Perhaps amongst us as students. It's a very big problem. I think, uh, I would say that it exists everywhere, you can't eliminate it, but it should remain within a certain threshold. It's like a disease. If, it, if it's not controlled, it becomes destructive. And it relates to the question of modernity and tradition, by the way. Are values timeless or changeable? What do you think? like you to think of this. Very important, in my opinion. Let me see if I reach the end of my questioning. Okay. Are we made of matter or matter and spirit? Again, it relates to question of modernity and tradition. Okay. So, I think I'm done with my questioning. It's like, it uh, goes back to Greek times. Um, but I guess, uh, when I was tasked to handle the fundamental question of securing the future of this country, I had to understand where we're we heading, why are we, why are we in the position that we are, you know? And, uh, so to question everything and in the process start to say you know, certain things seem to me um, logical, others didn't. Um, and behavior and how, we, how it influenced uh, the discourse was one of the things that I've tried to understand is why Qataris who came, who, who existed, who were here in the 40s, were, four, were about 11,000 people in 1941. How could we end up being 2.5 million? And why? Um, so all these questions, and how can we mitigate the risks? I mean, the risks of 11,000 people are different from the risks of 2.5 million people, no? It's fairly obvious. But have we exacerbated the risks? Have we reduced them? And all these questions about, I mean, are, are we, are we, are we, is there progress? Are we regressing? Um, are we in a position of greater security, lesser security? Um, what drove us to, to, into this direction? Do we, did we have the image of progress? I mean, 
Is modernity equates to progress? All these questions came by, you know, in my head. What, what made a group of people decide on a certain discourse? Because obviously that discourse has created a problem, no? I don't know how long some of you stay in traffic in Doha. I don't know how, how, how much activities do you do a day, passive activities on your own very feet, not using a car. So it created a situation that we have to deal with. It created insecurity in food, it created insecurity in water, it created insecurity in, in income, because guess what? Oil prices are down. I'm told that there is no budget for except for food, for the buffet. That's the only budget that we have. I guess as, a, as, a, as members of the faculty and administration, you have felt the, uh, the, the impact of oil prices going down. Um, I hope I'm making sense here to some of you, just trying to. There's a storm going on in my head and trying to make sense. But let's, uh, let's I'll, I'll, I'll pass on the responsibility to you now to, I don't know if you remember some of the questions that I've asked and would like you to perhaps have a go at answering some of them or even, you know, asking me or whatever, whatever you want to say or whatever you want to ask. And then I will engage with you and, and, and respond to, to your queries. So please have courage and ask the first question or make the first comment, because I could go on. And we will not have an hour. We'll probably have three hours talking. And I know that we're bound by 11 to finish. So please ask me any question you, you feel. I can continue, by the way. So no questions? OK. Let me go back to, then I, I'll, I don't know if I should answer these questions. I was expecting to see some of you answer some of those. Which of these, and which one should we start with? Let me go from the beginning. From where to where, history, present, future. Tell me, uh, tell me which one would you like us to stop at or start with? This one? OK. Wonderful. So what is tradition? Can anyone explain to me what is tradition? Or what is modernity or modernism? Anyone? Students, faculty, cameramen? Go ahead. So modernity is often seen as um, being only Western originated, and there's often a clash between what might not be, between the idea that oh, tradition is always something which is within yourself and it's something Eastern, and what it is, oh, it's something Western, something bad. And I know that there's a lot of um, prevailing discourse which makes them be opposite and in binary, seen in binary terms, and that they cannot even exist, coexist. And I know that that's a topic that people have been thinking about with the vertigo. Good. Who think that they can coexist? And who think that they cannot coexist? Go ahead. Actually, I was going to comment. I think it's interesting the idea of associating tradition with, you know, maybe an individual thing or even a collective, but when they specifically with the Western, especially if you look at the idea that there can be multiple traditions, but we generally see modernity referred to as a singular kind of idea or object, rather than exploring the idea of being able to have multiple modernities. Okay. Can they coexist? Go ahead. Um, I, I, I think they can coexist. I mean, lately in the past few decades, there has been a lot of revision of histories. There has been a lot of the non Western world, and they talk about contested modernities and different kinds of modernities, where, and indigenous modernities, where they try to, all the modernity is not, um, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a term that isn't associated, it's, it's completely in uh, opposition to tradition by adding things like, well, there could be an indigenous modernity or there could be a contested modernity that is, um, that is a struggle to somehow uh, reconcile the two terms.
terms, but uh, in reality, the values or the practices associated with both of those are similar. And in terms of modernity, I mean, the very Western term modernity is uh, industrialization, it's the creation of market economy. And uh, that, in no way, looking at it in those terms doesn't make modernity the it's of the Western. It could be applied everywhere, and it is applied everywhere. So it just comes down to how practices and social norms are seen in. Um, in opposition to both those terms that have been used to signify multiple things. Okay, you, you, you had an attempt at defining it. Good. Um, I want to. Uh, I want someone to tell me what modernity. What does it stand for? What is what does tradition stand for besides thinking about them as two concepts that either can coexist or. But if we just boil them down to their epistemological meaning. Go ahead. Um, I mean, I would argue that not only can traditional modernities coexist, but I think they should coexist because... But what are, well, uh, before we say what should they, how should they coexist, or what are, what are they? So I would say that tradition is sort of related to the status quo and sort of doing something just because it's been done in the past, and okay. sort of repeating actions Why isn't tradition related to free market economy or democracy? Why is modernity is associated with these so so called progressive ideas? Yeah, I think it's because I mean the free market economy came later on in, in like literally a historical progression. It was a more recent progression and you know like So Venice wasn't free in, in its economy in those days? I mean ha have the free market economy has just existed in the twentieth century? The free market economy and industrialization are consequences of the underlying philosophical principles that modernity have brought about. They're not the cause, and they're not the definition of it. That's how I believe it to be. Now, I have gone um, and in conflict with many people over how I see these two terms. I'll make it easy because I think I could see. Uh, I think it's it's clear that we don't from this this question and the answer is, is that we all have different views of what these two terms constitute. Correct. Um, I will take you back to. I mean, tr tradition is the transmission from the past to the present. So it's a living organ, it's not repeating the past. It's handing the baton from one generation to the other. And it's handing it on, at every level of, of our existence, economic, social, cultural. You know, it's, Qatar is blessed with palm trees. And you could look at the palm tree and you could see what is the living part of the palm tree. The one at the very top, correct? So you can see the whole trunk of the palm tree. And what does the trunk of the palm tree signify? The ancestral. You know, you could see the history of the palm tree by looking at its trunk, correct? And the living part is at the very top. I mean, is the living part at the very top repeating the, what happened below? No, it's just there's a different leaf, there's a different season. But it just builds on the ancestral. There is a connection between the past and the present. And that's what tradition is all about. Tradition has nothing to do with um, 
I mean, there is a misrepresentation of the term itself. Most of us think of tradition as old practices trying to, uh, things that shackle us, things that control us. My father's traditional, my mom is traditional, whatever, you know. That's not the case, unfortunately. And that's why tradition have um, sadly attracted uh, much of the negative perception about, about it. Um, and I blame the modernists for that. Because what is modern? Modern is the present. That's what it actually means. If we understand what modern stands for. And the present comes from where? And goes to where? And the present of today, is it going to be the present of tomorrow? Because if we take modern as the word itself, as the meaning of the word, and say, it is just the present. Two minutes later, the present has changed, correct? Or seconds later. So it ceases to even feed into the next second. Do you understand me? If that's the case, then how can modernity or modernism create any cohesiveness if it's just all about the present? And so why do I believe that while they have been uh, forcefully juxtaposed next to each other in today's world, that's the cause of conflict. That's, that's the cause of terrorism. That's the cause of contradiction. That's the cause of irony. Because what underlines tradition is spirituality, and what underlines modernity is the rejection of God from the 15th century onward. Yes, the church in the medieval era was corrupt and whatever, but we got rid of the church and we got rid of God together, all together. And Europe, for the first time in its history, have gone on a discourse of development completely on a material level without any spiritual framework, landing us into today's world. The world that is only driven by capitalism, only driven by materialism, without any regard to um, spirituality or human values. Because once, once, once the individual in the 15th century looked at himself and, and he defined himself as sovereign, because God no longer exists, God is dead by Nietzsche's definition. He, he can become the author of anything and everything, and nobody can challenge that person, right? And he became all of a sudden the artist, whereas the artist, as a term, was reserved to God. We became all creative all of a sudden, right? When the term creative was only reserved to God. Now, how many creative people are around there? Creative labs, creative this, creative that. How many artists, proclaimed artists, are there around? Plenty. And whatever they produce, which is purely subjective, is now imposed upon us uh, as a given that we can't challenge it. Because man's perspective of himself has changed. And while Man looked at himself as part of a creation pre-15th century. Man divorced himself from the creation because the creation involves what besides man? The plan, the, the planets, the, the, the trees, the animals, the earth, the mountains, the rivers. And when that divorce happened and man looked at himself and said, I am God on earth, everything else started to become a resource. The, plant, the trees became a resource, the mountains became a resource, the rivers became a resource, other fellow humans became a resource. 
we started. So modernity, in that sense, what underlines it um, as a philosophy is in pure individualism, the rejection of God, and the only variable that it, it rests on is the present, now, and nothing besides now, and also um, pure materialism, the progressive acts. There's no spiritual acts that guides that progressive material development. And most people will disagree with that. You know, oh, well, you know, now we have yoga. We're trying to restore spirituality from California, you know. Um, because we're made of what? As I said in one of those questions, are we made just of matter or are we made of spirit and matter? So it took us a while to discover that. And all those who don't believe in God somehow believe in some Hindu tradition that relates to God <laughs> um, or Buddhist traditions. Um, perhaps if I go to the mosque and I take the prayer that we do five times a day and I take it to a California studio and I start telling people this is a form of meditation, people will start praying like Muslims and they will think it's a sport. The capacity of one's mind. Whereas tradition ultimately is governed by the framework of spirituality. Okay? You are allowed to progress. You are allowed to develop, but there is rules to development. There's rules for progression, because you are not an individual. Although you have your individual rights, you have obligations. Again, one of those questions that I've asked. Okay? Otherwise, how can we become, how can we judge a certain act? If we're, uh, I mean, it's, it's not like we want to bake the cake and we want to eat it ourselves. We want to be able to ask for no one to judge us, but we want to be able to also judge certain acts that happen to, to society. Well, a terrorist act, isn't that, um, why would you judge it if you don't want to be judged? Oh, well, it's a physical injury. Well, injury is not just physical. Let's, let's define injury. It's not just physical. You can injure people by insulting their culture, by insulting their beliefs, and so on and so forth. So what happened in Qatar, just to take it from uh, these grand philosophical ideas and try to make sense out of it, is that we had a clash between the two. And we, were, we, we perceived that uh, somehow the perception was modernity is progress. And without the ability to discern what is right and what is wrong, what fits our culture, what doesn't, we imported ideas. And for each and every idea, there's a consequence. Please stop me at any point and ask me any question. I don't want to go on sounding like some, you know, preacher or guru trying to tell, convert you into believing what I believe. Um, but at any point, challenge me or ask me any question. Um, we came from the desert. We lived in tribes separate from each other. We were never in, a, in the same town because we could never concentrate in the same time because of what? There was a barrier, there was a physical barrier that stopped us from creating concentration, human concentration. What was that? Can anyone tell me what is that? Quickly. I'll help you, go ahead. Brilliant, wonderful. So people created urbanism before, before Qatar, was ever to be, to be Qatar, because of water, not because of oil and gas. Water was the prime fundamental resource that allowed cities like London, Paris, Berlin, Istanbul, Damascus, Baghdad, Tehran, and other places around the world to be the cities that they are today. And 
so there wasn't any any water so there was no um, population concentration and the people could not create Doha and I always say that my grandfather was not stupid he just didn't have the resource to do so um, but we did and then we ended up building Doha then for a few thousand people but then somehow someone told us oh guys you have lots of money because of oil and gas uh, oil then um, and therefore you have surplus capital. You have a lot of money compared to a processing capacity of people. We're like 15,000 people, huh? But we had more capital than the processing capacity of the nation to, to operate. So we had to make choices, correct? One has to make a decision. What am I gonna do with that money? And that takes me to the question What are the criteria of sound investment, correct? So Qataris were then at, the, at, at a turning point of saying, there, uh, we need the consultant, we need someone to advise us, to tell us what are we gonna do with that money, huh? Because everything that we knew about the future, modernity, progress, development, comes from the minds of the people who worked for who? The World Bank, all these experts, who came to us, we're still very primitive. 80% of Qataris were illiterate. Uh, the, actually, I would say even more than 80% around that time. So we were handed advice, we were given advice as to how we should develop. And that advice, you need to understand, was riddled and filled with what? Assumptions, correct? about who we are, what we are, what we stand for. Because when someone comes from Britain to advise people here, do they really ask the fundamental questions like, do you have water? Do you have people? Do you have food? No, they don't, because they come from a country that has, that these things are there for a given. Do you get my point? They will never ask these questions coming here because it's there. I mean, nobody asks when they wake up in, in England, do we have water, do we have food, do we have people? Because it's there. So this consultant flies over, paid a lot of money, comes to meet people like us, and gives an advice on the basis that the fundamental resources exist. Well, they don't. And of course, we take that advice and then we build our plans and our strategies on them, knowing very well that they will exacerbate the risk. We, sorry, we don't know that we will exacerbate, but we, we later discover that they have contributed to the exacerbation of risk. Because we have never questioned these fundamental assumptions. So we end up with having major, major risk, um, sin, um, uh, insecurity situations that we have to handle. So the criteria of investment is, so Qataris have started in the 40s with the discovery of oil, they've made their country, they became independent in 71, and they have now lots of money, they relied a lot on foreign advice to help them develop. That foreign advice, you need to understand that a lot of it was also a perception of what constitutes modern, what constitutes the present. Huh? That's why I'm bringing tradition into this discussion. Because it, there's a total disregard by that mind, by that the, 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 the group of people who advised us are influenced to a great degree by their culture. And you need to understand that their culture since the 15th century has been a culture of only one that promotes a certain discourse. One that is of materialism, one that underlines it in a form of explo exploitative approach to nature, you know, and, and 
But then one wants to understand where is our immunity to that? You know, what, why have we allowed this to happen to us? You know, the Japanese and what they have done to the, they've isolated themselves for God knows how many years, but then they were forced to open up. But they still managed to, even up until today, if you go to Japan, if any one of you have visited Japan, you'll find that they, they've again tried to put these two together, the tradition and modernity side by side, and not try to force each and every one of them on each other. They just allowed them to sort of sit side by side, um, coexist, but without forcing them on each other. Um, so Qatar ended up importing people, correct? What's the ratio of foreigners versus, versus locals? I think is the ratio of the room here, <laughs> right? I'm the only Qatari <laughs> amongst you, right? But we didn't just import the productive workforce, but we imported water too. Does any one of you know how many, how much um, water do we uh, do we get from the sea for our needs? Huh? Yeah, we take that for granted. We go every morning and we open the tap and we want the shower to come and we expect that our cars are clean and we expect that when we go and wash our hands, this water is just going to come. Correct? We never ask these fundamental questions, exactly like the consultants when they come. They never ask. So 100% of our water comes from the sea. All the water that you enjoy today. So let me ask another question. What is the water reserve then, if everything comes from the sea? Go ahead. 48 hours. Wonderful. Now let me ask another question. If we only have 48 hours of water reserve and everything comes from the sea, does Qatar, this small nation that has no big army, no economic or military might like America, do we control the Gulf or do we, do we have exclusive control of the Gulf, which is the source of our water, or is the Gulf shared with other countries? Is it shared? With how many countries? Six, seven, maybe? Is there a nuclear plant just not far away from us called Abu Shahr? Correct? Have we heard of Fukushima? Have you heard what happened? Is Japan reliant on the sea for its water? These are questions. That's why I'm putting things in question form. Right? I hope I made my, justified my approach. Because these are the questions. These are the things that I started to ask. This is my approach. And if we share the Gulf with other countries, and not only we share the Gulf, but let me remind you of the Gulf of Mexico scenario. Does anyone know the Gulf of Mexico? What happened? 2010. 18 million barrels in some four, four months or something of that sort. And that's the Gulf of Mexico. That's a huge gulf, that's a deep gulf, and the United States of America does not depend on the Gulf of Mexico for its water. But imagine if I have two situations here. I have plenty of oil rigs, I have plenty of oil ships that sail or ship the, the, you know, the gulf, and I have a nuclear plant, which is probably 150 miles away from me. So I could have both the Gulf of Mexico scenario, and I could have the Fukushima scenario, and I could have the terrorist in between. And I only have 48 hours of water. So now let's imagine a scenario together. Water c contaminated due to a nuclear earthquake happened. Iran is a prone to earthquakes? Yes. Wonderful. Earthquake happened in Iran. The Abu Shahar plant, there's a leak. Contamination, it's, it's radioactive, it's not just oil, huh? Nuclear contamination. Reached the Gulf because of the current. We can't have access to water, correct? 48 hours, there's no water. Now we have a situation here because 
90% of our population are expats, right? We're, well, if things are good, we're here. If things are bad, thank you very much. Qatar Airways. <laughs> Akbar. We'll see you later, guys. Fix the problem. Now, how much of our economy is dependent on you? It's an exact mirror. So if you constitute 90% of the population, 90% of my economy depends on you, correct? If you go, what will happen to my economy? Total collapse. Total, I'm saying total. De death. There is no life after. Why there is no life after? All well, people will say, well, you know, Germany and England and France went through the Second World War and the First World War, and they, were, and they bound back. Oh, yeah, wonderful, because they have what? They have the water, they have the food or the agri-land, and they have the people. So they have the three fundamental resources to rebound, correct? Do we have any of those three? Answer is simply no. Just say no. Don't have doubt. That's why I asked the question, where is this truth question? God, can you handle truth? <laughs> Do you get my point now I'm asking these crazy questions? Do you have the ego to deny that? Yes, people, believe me, after putting these facts together, still people wanted to argue and say, Yes, but we live in a globalized world. I said, brilliant. Then I want a letter from you, Mr. Telling me, pulling the card of globalization. I said, what's your nationality? I'm American. I said, I want Congress tomorrow to give me a Qatari, a guarantee that if any of these scenarios happen, that I will be immediately admitted into the US. <laughs> well, well, that's something beyond my capacity. Then, then shut up. <laughs> Don't start telling me how to handle my own risks, my own problems. And people, so I have to deal with people who will always say, oh, well, you know, you're too, you know, too pessimistic. Well, I guess the Germans weren't too pessimistic. The Brits or the French, uh, when the Second World War dawned on them, they were, I mean, do you know, have you heard of Land's Army? where women ended up on the fields in, in Britain to, to, to plow the land for, because men went to fight. Because there is no upside to any nation. Do you get my point? There's always downsides. There's no just a big happy party. The party comes to an end. And then maybe another party will start. The question is, will you exist for the second party? Or will you disappear? Oh, Qatar is missing now. It, it dropped out of the 194 nations. <laughs> so we say, I'll take you back to a question that I asked. What makes a country viable? I think I gave you enough clues to answer that question. First, give me quickly what makes a country viable. Water. Wonderful. Second. Fantastic. Agricultural food. Brilliant. Third. Brilliant. There's one for fourth one, which is interchangeable. It, cha it changed through, throughout history. Let me give you a clue. It started with wood. Huh? No, no, it started with wood. Energy. It started with wood. We ended up to coal. Now we're in oil. Now we're moving into the next phase renewables and stuff. So four things make a country viable. Four fundamental things. If they do not exist in any country, that country is period not viable. Now out of the four, how many does Qatar have? Say it. One. Brilliant. We have 194 countries. Some of you here have done foreign foreign service studies, some of you have done economics, others have done history and whatnot. 194 countries. Uh, if you take the 194 and you put these four criterions on them, how many of them will be four to four? Four out of four. Maybe 50? 
How many will be three out of four? How many of them will be two out of four? And how many of them will be one of four, out of four? Now, do you believe that the ones who have four out of four and the ones who have one out of four, like Qatar, can they both apply the same economic model? Yes or no? Say it. Are we applying the same economic model of the US here? Then we're doomed. Correct? Because, again, let me take you. The danger of what? I warn you against assumptions. So, if that's the case, I go back to this question. What criteria should we apply for our investments? There are three criteria. Any sound investor applies normally. First, if I want to invest, what do I need? What do I expect from my investment? Return. Return. Great. Second, I, when I invest some, my money, I want the thing to be low. Great. And then there's a third thing. If, I make, if the risk is low and I want high returns, I want also the cost of my investment to be low, correct? So if I take $20,000 to JP Morgan, let's say QMB, for the sake of putting things in local context, and QMB says, I will give you 1,000 reals per year for your 20,000, or $1,000 for your 20,000. That is 2,000, that's 10%. But to keep that 20,000 with us, we will charge you 4,000. Are you following? So I, I take $10,000 to QMB, and they tell me we'll give you $1,000 every year. That is what? What constitutes that? 10%, right? Return. Correct? Are you following me? And, but they say, in order for you to keep that money with us, we will charge you $2,000 a year. That's the cost of just keeping the money with us. So they, the, the $2,000 ate the, the $1,000, the return, and it's also eating the capital, correct? So I'm having something called negative, what? Return. Am I getting negative returns? Plus, they tell me, by the way, if you keep your money with us, the entire capital is not subject to security. So it might disappear if something happens. Now, this is the investment model that we're following in Qatar. We're experiencing negative returns at very high risk, at very high cost. Do you want me to explain or no? Okay. We have the surplus capital, as I indicated earlier, and we have a small population. Someone should have come and told us, well, guys, if you want to invest at a low cost, at a reduced risk, take that capital and spread it in 70, 80 countries around the world, where the costs of absorbing that capital are already taken care of by those countries. So if I take, for example, um, let's, let's say Egypt, for the sake of the argument. We have perhaps 30,000 30, Egyptians here. If, if by bringing 30,000 Egyptians to Qatar, I have to build what for them? Houses, schooling, roads, police, everything. That is a cost or, or uh, an income? Great. And then 30,000 Egyptians are what? Are they Qataris or they're, as, as the system goes here, they're what? They're expats. What happens at the end of every month when they get their paychecks? Goes back. So there's money going out. And there's also a cost that is happening in Qatar because I'm building all this infrastructure for them. Right? And what do we 
export primarily out of Qatar. One thing, gas and oil. What do we import? Everything. So even there's more money going out, correct? There's money going out from remittance. There's money going out from me buying everything. And there's a cost that I've done, uh, I have incurred because of accommodating an expatriate workforce. And believe it or not, I give these people the experience of training. And then what happens to them? They go back. Isn't that a value lost? Am I experiencing negative return or positive return? What do you think? Answer. Don't have doubt. Why the hell then are we adopting this model? I didn't answer this. You did. Because someone told us this is progress. Bullshit. You can edit this later. Someone told us modernity equates to progress. Someone told us this is development. Growth is great. Growth requires capacity. And all the capacity that you have is what? Borrowed. Correct? Have you borrowed the people? Have you borrowed the water? 95% of your food is imported. Why the hell are you growing? You need qualitative development, not quantitative. So instead of concentrating 2.5 million people from all over the world in one small, tiny jurisdiction like Qatar, you could t to operate your capital. That's the ultimate goal, no? We have money. We want to operate this capital, but we have the illusion that we want to be developed. And what is development is growth. So we have a confusion between these two terms. Diabolical confusion. Confusion that needs a cure at a, with, a, with some shrink, you know? And then instead, we could have taken the money and instead of having 2.5 million people having to leave their countries and come to this place, we are very hospitable. We love you all. It has nothing to do with you know, not wanting to have people here. But this place is repulsive. The, the nature of this place is repulsive to concentration of humanity. Otherwise, my ancestral parents would have created the city a long time ago, correct? This, well, this is, I called it, uh, Allah uh, Ant, uh, Antoine Shadid. Does anyone know Antoine Shadid? I'm, I, I think I've passed my time. Yeah, by two minutes, I'll, I'll conclude. Anthony Shadid, he was a New York Times uh, writer, came to interview me a few years ago. And I said to him, he said, I want to quote you. I said, don't quote me. But say an official said that. And uh, you can go. And, and I said to him, this is Mars on Earth. Maybe NASA should come and experiment on how to make this a natural, sustainable, livable condition, not to go and you know, somewhere. Because there is no water, there is no food, and this place is not uh, hospitable to human concentration. And if it's not hospitable to human concentration, therefore, we have to adopt an economic model that recognizes that fact. It's like a baby born with multiple disabilities. As a nation, Qatar is a baby born with multiple disabilities. And therefore, you have to either reduce those disabilities, the, the impact of them as you grow, or exacerbate them. Correct? And what we have done, what do you think we've done? Have we, have we managed those disabilities or, uh, wisely, or we have exacerbated them? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.